Okay, everybody, this is going to be technology plus non-linguistic representations equals learner success. This will probably be busted up into two parts because it's going to be pretty long. But this is a presentation that was given at the MACE Conference 2011, Manhattan, Kansas at Kansas State University. I'm Curtis Chandler. I'm the 2011 Kansas Teacher of the Year. I'm going to walk you through a very brief summary of the presentation itself and try and show you as much as we did um, during the activity itself at MACE. So with that, here we go. Okay, um, like I said, as Kansas Teacher of the Year, I get to snoop around people's classrooms, and I've been able to see some really neat things going on in different people's rooms. Overall, what we're talking about is this. Um, I have my own family. Count of three, say, aw. Oh. One, two, three. Aw. Oh. There you go. And while I teach older students, I do have four younger sons, and I watch them very closely. They're kind of my elementary school and pre-K guinea pigs, and so I, I get a chance to mess around and observe students of all different ages, and this is what we come up with. We're going to do a quick lightning tour of the research, and we're going to look at how non-linguistic representations can be used to improve classroom learning, okay? But we're also going to explore the need for teacher and student creativity in the midst of all this. And I want you to remember all this by Dirty Harry. Remember Dirty Harry's famous line, I'm going to ask yourself just one question. And he always said something like, do you feel lucky, punk? We're going to change that. Since we're in schools, this is what you need to remember. Is it verbal? Is it visual? Are they moving around? Am I creative and giving chances to create? Can you say that with me? Go. Is it verbal? Is it visual? Are they moving around? Am I creative and giving chances to create? Since we're in schools, no gun. Just very sharp pencil. There you go. And what research says. We always talk about what research says. When we look at research in education, there's probably more research than we're ever going to have time to read. So when I pick up research, what I like to look at is meta-analysis because it takes numerous studies and lines them up side by side by side by side and says, what do all of them have in common? And that's what makes meta-analysis, I think, more useful than other types. And meta-analysis says this, that uh, non-linguistic representations is when we generate mental pictures to go along with information, as well as when we create a graphic representation for that image. So a, a young person learns the word sun, and their brain associates, associates that with an image. That's a non-linguistic representation, allowing our brain to plug into both the verbal, over here on the right where it says sun, and the visual on the other hand. Okay. And what research also says is that the more students use both of these systems, the better off they're going to be as learners. They'll think about and recall what they've learned. Now, this has been around for a while. Pavio said that young people and all people learn things two ways, linguistically and non-linguistically. So by images and moving around as well as those verbs. And what did Dirty Harry say? You remember? Is it verbal? Is it visual? Are they moving around? Am I creative giving chances to create? And the pencil. So that's just going to be a cutesy way with a little bit of rhythm to help us remember what all the research says. Research also says that it helps us see how topics connect. These are some visual representations from your childhood. The sun, its place in the universe, as well as the process of photosynthesis. Okay, those are common ones. But it also says that it allows us to recall our ideas and organize those. I have four sons. Uh, they're not really into gardening, it seems, until it's time to pull up our garden in the fall. And then they get really interested, and they want to grow stuff indoors all of a sudden. So what they have to do is use that mental model of what they use, know of photosynthesis, and try and figure out what elements will actually make things grow indoors. There's an example. Okay. So in summary, what does research tell us? <gasps> not much that we probably don't already know. Okay. So why do we care about it? Well, because Marzano's work showed that it has one of the highest impacts on student achievement, non-linguistic representations. He also said that teachers tend to favor non-linguistic form. Makes sense. If you look over here, in the early elementary uh, levels, pre-K and so on and so forth, the blue is the verbal, right? And we don't use that as much as we use the visual and the kinesthetic. That's awesome. But the problem is, as soon as their verbal skills go up, in other words, as soon as they learn how to read, we tend to take away the visual and the kinesthetic. And Marazano says that's bad because teachers tend to favor that form, sorry, the verbal form, but also the non-linguistics have one of the highest impact on student achievement. The last thing he said is that the use of non-linguistic representations is probably the most underused. So when your best tool is your most underused one, there's probably a problem in education and in classrooms. So here's an example. Do you know what this is? This is a treadmill, but it's an amazing one. This is like the Nordic Track GPS Emulator 79000 something. And what it allows you to do is like plug in coordinates someplace in the world and it downloads the terrain. So I could like hike in the Andes Mountains if I wanted to from my basement or from my home. I could uh, run in Central Park without getting mugged. Okay? And so that's what this does. But do you know what people do with this fantastic treadmill? Well, they leave it alone. They don't use it. They end up hanging their shirts and stuff on it because that's what we do. Now, why do I bring that up? Again, when your top-notch tools are your most underused, you've got a problem. 
That's why I'm looking at it. The other thing I'm looking at is this. Uh, research also shows that student involvement in the creation of non-linguistic representations increases brain activity and improves learning. So, yeah, it's one thing for us to provide them with mental models and mnemonics, but it's a whole other thing to get them involved in the creation of that process. Okay? All right. So this is what we're going to talk about. Since we're at MACE, we're going to talk about how we can use technology to foster teacher and student creativity in that process. Ultimately, we can give it to them, like I said. That's level one. Level two is going to be to get them involved in the creation of their own. Okay? All right. Newsweek was all over this. This is what they said. This is the short Mr. Chandler version. Hey, our IQ scores have steadily gone up over the past 40 years, but this is the first time forever that our creativity scores have gone down. That's what Newsweek reported. Now, that's sad and scary because you think um, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, we prided ourselves on being the right brain nation, putting out the creative thinkers and so on and so forth, where the other competitive nations like China cranked out rote memorization, basic mastery of skills and content. Well, now, Newsweek is saying we've completely switched models. And that's sad and scary because we're driving, sorry, the world is being driven by the creative mind. Give me an example. I've got my phone here somewhere. I don't know how many of you have a smartphone. Okay, here's mine. And what you'll find is a bunch of apps. One of those is, if it'll load up here, sorry, it's charging. Here's a game called Bubble Ball. I don't know if you've played Bubble Ball, but Bubble Ball has several hundred thousand downloads. And Bubble Ball itself was designed by a 14-year-old boy from Spanish Fork, Utah. This is the level of creativity that young people can come up with. Bubble ball. And what we typically end up doing is just providing essential skills and content and never saying, okay, now what can we create with that? Sad and scary. Okay? So think of it this way. How did you learn to write an introduction? Think about that. Uh, maybe you can remember the activity. Maybe you can barely remember how to write an introduction. But I want to show you an example of a class that I visited. This was uh, a teacher named Mrs. Cuckelman who was teaching her students the, the essentials of how to write an introduction. Okay? Now you're probably thinking, what the heck was that? <laughs> well, what she has is a class created this right here. This is their mnemonic to help them remember that an introduction has to have three things. A hook or lead, and she taught them seven ways to start every introduction. Has to have some background on your topic and your one main point, which is your thesis, which is what she taught them. And she threw them all together in a song that looks like this. Every introduction has to have three things. Every introduction has to have three things. You have to have a hook or lead to draw the reader in and some background on your topic and your thesis. And she teaches them to the tune of if you're happy and you know it. Now, if you're happy and you know it. So they go through this for a couple days, and you'd be amazed at when they go to write the essay on the state assessment or later on. They say, what goes in an introduction again? She says, hmm, I don't know. What do we know that would help us remember that? They go back to the desk, and they'll see, you'll see them do this because it's locked into their brain, because they've learned it verbally, visually, and they're moving around. Okay? And that's what we're getting at. At any point, you can create little musical activities. Sorry about that. You can create little activities, and you can record those, capture those using a camera phone or, or a webcam or something. And then you share those with the other classes to say, look, this is what our students are creating, but also to provide these introductions to activities where students are going to need to learn their introduction or the conclusion or whatever it is. So letting your students be creators and then using whatever technology you have on hand, be it a camera phone or a webcam or video camera to capture and share that. Okay? Why don't we use home exercise equipment more? Well, for the most part, it's because of time, right? And it's the same thing with non-linguistic representations. Why don't we use them more? Well, you can ask teachers this, and most of the time they say it's because I just don't have time. I'll give you an example. I visited a class, third grade social studies, and this is what they're handing out for their study guide. This is about one-third of the study guide. Very heavy on the verbal. So I talked to the teacher afterwards, and I said, would you mind if I created a little graphic, organization, a graphic organizer, a non-linguistic representation for this? And she said, sure. So I created this in about 14 minutes just using PowerPoint, because that's all I had at the school there. And so you have to, this begs the question, why didn't the teacher create this and put it side by side with this heavily verbal study guide? And the answer is, well, even the best teachers lack time. So there has to be a way to speed up the creation of non-linguistic representations. So one suggestion we have is just to work with teachers on how to turn their ideas for graphic organizers into some sort of visual just using basic drawing programs. So here's the first suggestion. 
help teachers learn how to Google search and to draw better. Okay? Here's a heavy, heavy text. What is the water cycle? You can take a look at it. It's pretty boring and dense. But none of us will forget the content because uh, most of the time it's presented with that diagram that shows you the water cycle. You probably remember this. Putting the verbal and the visual side by side is essential. But a teacher has to know how to go to Google and Google search what? Water cycle. And then click on that, blow it up to the biggest possible one. We tend not to do that. We get these little pixelated versions. And always make sure that we have the verbal and the visual side by side. I walked into a class. He had two teachers doing the same activity about side by side. They were doing Venn diagrams, compare and contrast, Batman versus Superman to introduce the concept. And one teacher was excited because they were using what? The classic Venn diagram over here on this side. And then over here, this other version, a T-chart walked into the class next door and using just inserting of clip art this is what this teacher did okay so you can tell that this one's a little busy over here but look at this now even uh, your students that are struggling with the concept can see oh Batman on this side Superman on this side and this is what they have in common the visuals themselves help you understand what is where on the chart so what we do is we talked about this we're not going to go into it right now is you need to provide structured playtime to teachers using whatever tool their smart boards, their Promethean boards, basic drawing tools, and show them how easy it is to create these things so we really have no excuse to not spend the time to create the verbal and the visual side by side. After you can do this, what do teachers do? Well, teachers teach parallel lines, perpendicular lines, with a little in, uh, inserting of clip art and drawing. These are the diagrams that you find on other teachers' walls. Um, I worked with a teacher who was trying to teach how to write a conclusion. All of this on the right-hand side. She was trying to say, look, Remember that most of what you have in your, where's my mouse? There it is. Remember that most of what you put in your conclusion is stolen from other parts of your essay. Remember to reword your thesis, review your main points, find an exit. And so the question became, what could we create using basic drawing tools to help the students remember this? And this is what she came up with. And you can look at it and you can match it up, okay? Everything in your essay is stolen. See how he's got the little bandit mask? Reword your thesis. Remember your one main point, that's your thesis. Review your main points from the essay. There's your three main points and find an exit. There it is. And she puts these side by side and says, all right, let's see if you can find all these things on the bulleted list in the picture. And gives them that little mnemonic to help them remember. Even better, after that, after we showed her the introduction has to have three things, she came up with a song as well to teach her students this. And that's really cool. That's teachers creating, but what we really want to get to is students creating. And that's why I go back to this example. The students actually helped create this. When students are involved in the creation process, it's more likely that they're going to remember the content and learn more from that process. Their learning improves. So in general, what are we talking about? Don't just use your smart and Promethean boards as, uh, as a projected surface. Use them as interactive drawing tools. If you don't have smart, or smart boards or Promethean boards, go back to those basic, basic drawing tools and learn to use them well. The rule is no matter what tool you use, no matter what tool, when used effectively, it can be an effective resource. Okay? And remember, the reason why we do this is the more students use both of those systems, the verbal and the visual side by side, the more likely they're going to be able to think about and recall what it is that they've learned. Don't forget, though, that student involvement in the creation is going to improve that process. So while teacher created is great for us to give it to them, student created is even better. And we're not talking about just copying down what the teacher has. Involve the students in the process of organizing and synthesizing the information in a graphic representation so they're involved in it. So uh, I was snooping around a school in, in El Dorado, Kansas. I was walking around the hall, and this is what the teacher had said. They had this whole unit on energy, and the final project was this. What would all this look like in a single piece of paper or a single landscape? And so these posters had to have all the different types of energy represented. So you've got, oh, sorry. You've got chemical energy being represented here, mechanical energy, thermal, and all these. This is my favorite, electromagnetic energy on the slides, like static which is kind of cool. So that's a pretty good idea. What would this look like? Good question to ask. We're well, around the corner, even better. Another poster, it might have been the same teacher, and these sticky notes were actually feedback from the teacher and from the students. So in the MACE conference, okay, this is what we talked about. We said, how would something that you saw here at MACE, all these technology tools that we're talking about, what tool or how could one of those tools be used to enhance this assignment? And that's the challenge, the activity we gave for about five minutes. Since you weren't there, too bad, you miss out. So here's suggestion two. Acting out and sharing of important vocabulary. So what we're going to talk about is acting out terms plus a, a phone. You go to students in the room, you say, all right, act out these terms. What would parallel lines look like? They can use their arms, okay? 
what we like to have them do is use their body and maybe even use the floor. And this is what they come up with. Something like this. And they say, all right, take a picture and send that to me. How about perpendicular lines? Take a picture of your phone and send it to me. Okay? And here's the activity that we gave at Mace. Slope. Use your partner right now at your table or desk. Figure out what slope would look like with your bodies or your hands. Please take a picture and then send that to me at my email address. Send your word at Mace. Too bad. You missed it. All right. Another one is vocabulary links plus a document camera. This is cake. Any content area can do this. I had to substitute teaching a science class, and I'm not nearly as knowledgeable in science as I wanted to be. But this is what the teacher did. They had all these terms divided up. They had to go through the book, the text, and they had to create all these different parts. Write the term or concept, define your own words, all these things. The one I liked was create a drawing. And then the students themselves would create these drawings. Oh, would create these drawings and then share those with the rest of the class. So let's say my word is electron. I'd use the definition on that create a drawing and then share that with the class and the teacher. And then they would give ideas about how it can be improved using the document cam. Okay. And then the... Oh, I'm dying here. Here we go. And then after that, the student or myself, you know, we would revise the drawing. So that's what, that was what would happen. You can divide up those terms. Jigsaw it. Using the document camera, they share their first draft. They ping the ideas off of the classmates and the teacher who help with the content. And they revise it and get a pretty good representation, non-linguistic, of that topic or term. Now, with any students, any content area, with just one computer, you can start to ask questions like, class, what would this look like? Okay? What would this look like? So same class. Here's another teacher who had a class of all boys. This is what his students came up with. Class, what would this look like? Parallel lines? Motorcycles racing side by side. And he said, okay, what would perpendicular lines? So they're all around the single computer and they're creating this. That's right, motorcycles crashing. Anybody want to guess what slope looks like with the motorcycles in this class of all boys? There you go. And so involving the students again in the process of creation. Okay? Here's another way. We want to get them verbal, visual, moving around. Here's another teacher who has all these terms to teach, just a list of vocabulary words. So he, ha he teaches his students this song and has them act out each of the words. Ready? I don't know if you can hear all that. I don't know if you can hear all that, but what he does is they act it out, they sing it, they dance it, and then part of the class project is to have each of the students tell what their favorite word is and why that is. Okay, so you've got a little bit of metacognition. What a way to speed up content delivery. That's amazing. Okay, now let's let's see how he did. Is it verbal, visual, moving around? Absolutely. Is he creative? Yes. Is he giving his students chances to create? Well, all but that last one. And so I asked him about that, and he said, don't worry about it, Mr. Chandler. What we actually do is we have the students also create their own non-linguistic representations to go along with it. So he's doing all of them. It's great. Here's another example. Walked into a class where a teacher's trying to illustrate the connection between Rasputin and the Romanov family to get him ready for a book. I think it was Animal Farm. Okay. And so the question becomes, how can she teach this in the most creative, effective way? So this is Soviet history plus the Nintendo Wii. Before class even starts, she's got this game loaded up, and they're coming in, they start dancing to this. You ready? Name of the song is Rasputin. They kind of get the hang of that. Then the lyrics kick in, and she used that little dancing activity with the students. Bell rang. She handed out the lyrics, and they started to go through the lyrics and talk about the real history behind that. 80% of it was semi-accurate. She talked about that, but she helped them make the connection between. What was the original one, you remember? It was the connection between Rasputin and the Romanov family. So there's an example of enhancing the content through something verbal, visual, then moving around. Okay?
How'd she do? Great. Here's another suggestion. In general, teachers need to do more with students' tools. Okay? But we also need to let students do more with their tools. Now, this is one that we shared. We're going to go through it pretty quick. Um, you weren't at Mace. You missed it. And here's the basics. A teacher gave an assignment and said, all right, I want you to phone cast this. Use your cell phone to call in your final project. But you can do it however you want, as long as I can listen to it. And he said, but if you have another idea, just let me know. So another student came to him. Where's my mouse? Another student came to him and said, can I use my guitar to do part of it? He said, absolutely. He had another student, same assignment. He says, can I take it home and use GarageBand to do it? Absolutely. So he gets all these different projects, all by allowing students to do more with their own tools. Let's go through these pretty quick. Those are examples. All right. In general, we need to harness classroom creativity. We have to open up where a student can come to us and say, hey, is it okay if I do this? I had a student come to me and say, can I do a diorama for my project? That wasn't one of the options. And whenever a student asks, can I do it my own way, the answer is always yes. Let's just make sure it meets the objectives. Okay? And so I clarified that with him. So the, these are the objectives. Make sure it meets this. And he came up with this fantastic diorama. And after he brought it in, we used um, our cell phone camera or a webcam or whatever just to record that and share it with the other classes and put it on the website. So this is what it looks like. This is my diorama of chapter 21, The Attack. And over here you have the, the boats that they sailed up on shore with, and there's a pirate coming for the stockade. And here's the provisions that they lost. So you get the hang of it, but he goes on and explains the whole thing. We have part to whole relationships. The evaluation and synthesis of content, the important parts of the chapter, to do a fun retelling of a couple of the chapters. And he did an excellent job. Okay, whole thing was what? What does this look like in their classroom? It's a learning environment where students feel, com feel comfortable exploring alternatives. Right? A better way to say it would be, Mr. and Mrs. Can I do this instead? If you can get your students to start asking those types of questions, help them feel comfortable to do that. I think we're better doing our jobs. So summary. Classroom creativity looks like what? Students ask, can I do this? The answer is yes. Let's make sure it meets the objectives and then help them uh, come up with a, a fantastic final project. Then use technology to share those with other people. So you open this up, kids come up with all sorts of things. Um, drawings of, let's see, Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Uh, to scale cities out of Legos of entire cities in the Arabian Peninsula. These are Machiavelli cookies. I just Googled non-linguistic representations and these are student samples that came up. Okay. So on their terms, think about that. What are other types of non-linguistic representation projects that students have been able to come up with on their own terms, with their own tools? As you think through that, you've probably seen some students do some amazing things. Okay? Remember to capture that using video. I think we already talked about that. All right, so here's another example. This is English shorts. Okay? This is what we do. Any project that's outstanding in our class, we try and highlight that on a website. And we make them very simplistic to start with. We just use our hands, little puppets or cutouts to teach things. So here's an example of one. Oh, why do we do this? Sorry, student involvement in the creation of non-linguistic representations increases the brain activity. Remember that. So I think I'm out of sequence here. I think we're going to come back to this. I think the whole idea was just to show you that if you go to our English Shorts website, and here's the URL right here, you can see a bunch of students' projects that are hosted. Sorry about that. Okay. Here's another example. This is using Google Earth to 3D model. Students love to mess around with Google Earth, so we tried to see what we could do with it. And this is what we came up with. Okay? If you look, this is, our, this is where our middle school is. This is Wamigo Middle School, and we start there. And anytime content is tagged to, or um, connected to geography, we make a representation of that on our Google Earth map. So here's a, an expository article we did on modern day pirates in the Strait of Malacca. And as you zoom in, you'll see these models that we set up as a class. Okay, here's this huge tanker, and next to it is this teeny tiny speedboat because the article was all about um, something in National, Graphic that the, National Geographic that they reported. These teeny tiny speedboats are taking over these huge tankers. And we wanted to give the students a sense of where it was at and the scale of each of these. So we thought if we can do it for an article, can we do it for a whole book? Okay, so you go to Google's 3D warehouse and you Google things like cargo ship. It'll give you a bunch of models. You import those into Google Earth, okay? You pick one that you want and you blow it up really, really big so you can actually see it from, print, from pretty high up, and that's what you get. So all we did was import 3D models and blew them up pretty big and tried to keep the scale. So then we're like, okay, Treasure Island, can we do the same thing? Starts off in London. So this is London that we created. 
you've got the Parliament Building, uh, Big Ben, uh, London Bridge. But this is where our story actually takes place in Bristol. Okay, so here's uh, the Admiral Benbow Inn in the background there, the graves of some people who were killed, and the line represents the chronology of all the places that Jim and the characters vis visited. That's where Long John Silver was introduced. There's the original ship. And so as we continued on the journey, we built this model. Now here's an example of a teacher trying to be creative, but ultimately what we want to do is to get our students to be creative. That's level two. So to put these tools in their hands and see what you can create. So here's a key scene where, I don't know, I think this is, yeah, this was the apple barrel where Jim overhears that they're pirates. And then uh, at that point, I just got carried away. I thought, can I make all of Treasure Island? So what you're going to see is um, my version of Treasure Island just by blowing up um, geog or sorry, um, topographical models and things like that. There's the rowboat where they came to shore. You're probably bored with this because you haven't read the book or you don't care about it, but here you go. So there's Treasure Island. Okay, We built it. Actually, I made it so big it looks like it overlapped with Florida, so sorry about that. But oh well. What's the whole point of that? Well, the whole point of that is really we have the capability to build some of the most incredible non linguistic representations using basic modeling tools in something like Google Earth. Okay? Here's another activity we talk about the creation of antimatter in like a science class. You use PowerPoint to make a very basic, basic animation. Then you play a game called Bump. And what we did with Bump is we took two balls and we had to have the students stand about 15 feet apart and they had to try and toss them and get them to collide. Okay? Then we handed them little marbles and say, hey, what would, what would change with that? Okay? Got them thinking about smashing things together, how difficult that is the smaller that they are. And then we introduced the concept of splitting atoms, creating antimatter. Okay? I'm trying to see where I went from this. Um, CERN actually has a video that they put online that explains the process. Shows you all around their facilities, the actual atom splitting places, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I thought it was a decent video, but the students actually found it to be pretty boring. So what some of the students came up with is they said, isn't there a scene like this in that movie we saw? So here, here's CERNs. So they walk you around it, show you the sites. I thought it was pretty cool, but they suggested one from Angels and Demons. And so we ended up doing the following classes and the following year was actually using that clip from Angels and Demons to introduce the concept as well. And then we hand them the questions where they have to draw some things from the text, answer the questions. I think the text came out of uh, Michelle Kaku's book, uh, Physics of the Impossible. Yeah, there it is, right there. And what this does, does is it raises the question. Suggestion five, rethinking how it is that we use video and other media. And these are the handouts. I'd pause it here if you want to take a look at these. But the short version is we can use it to support, where's my mouse, again, support attention and motivation, okay? We can use video and animation to add aesthetic appeal and humor. We can do it for representational, like in this case. If we want to show students what uh, antimatter creation might look like, we find an accurate depiction of that. Mnemonics, when we, treat, when we teach uh, parallel episodes, repeating of events and stories, we use Goldilocks and the Three Bears, just to show students uh, a mnemonic for something they can remember on the state assessment. So now when they see parallel episodes, they'll think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You can use it to build background knowledge for generating discussions, like if we want to talk about the implications of second life. Instead of reading a whole article, we could show a video and then focus on the discussion, if that's the process. You can minimize the cognitive load. When we introduced Romeo and Juliet to eighth grade students, we spent a lot of time watching the movie with the subtitles on and discuss it to help minimize the, con the, re sorry, minimize the cognitive load on something that's very, very challenged in the first encounter. And here's the last one I'm really excited about, which is allowing students to demonstrate mastery of content. Let students create non-linguistics. Let them create videos and animation and everything like that to show that they're mastering the content and that they're creating something new and original. Here's an example. I had a science teacher who says what? He says, well, I want to have my students create something, so where do I start? And I said, just pick your most boring unit because it's going to bomb anyway already, right? And so he created, he had his rock unit. They had to learn all these different types of rocks and the scientific process behind the creation. And he packages the, the content to the essentials and says, all right, Let's see if you can take your part of the content and create something that's fun for the other students. Kind of a cool concept. And they came up with this, which is rock band. And so what you're going to see is them dancing around, singing songs, and we put the subtitles on so you could hear what they say. So.
So there's an example of how the dreaded unit became the one that the students look forward to the most. Because he cuts down the content to the essentials and says, what can you create with it? And he's using technology to share that. Music creation and then webcams, video cameras to share those with other students. Okay? So what can you do with very, very basic technology? Something like this. This is Treasure Island, Chapter 1. The old sea dog at this Admiral Bimbo. It starts off with a sunny beach and Admiral Bimbo in the distance. Shows a man walking up to the Admiral Bimbo. So what this student is doing is using voices and pictures to retell a fairly boring chapter in Treasure Island. The idea was take a text that isn't that engaging and ask the students to turn it into something that's fun and engaging for others. They called over Jim. Jimmy! Help me carry my sea chest up to my room. Oh, by the way, he says, watch out for that seafaring man with one leak. He runs off. So Jim is stuck with the sea chest, carrying it up to the, his room. <laughs> Okay, so there's one way. Just let students use their hands and cuts, cutouts to recreate content for class. Another example. English shorts. Today we'll be talking about flashback, foreshadow, on and on of here. Flashback is to enter the present, see into the past. I know you're having a hard time right. seeing it, so just listen. When Larry King, somebody old, says, back in the day, that's includes that there's going to be a flashback. Foreshadow is to give any clues about what will come in the future. Like when some in a movie, some hot girl is walking and walks into the door and there's creepy music and she's like, I hope there's nobody in here. Well, yeah, she's probably going to end up dying. Um, on a monopia is when words mean the same as how they're said. Like roar, splat, and emerald when he says BAM! Okay, so there's an example of a student who chose three terms from all the terms of the unit and had to create something with the hands and pictures and voices that accurately, accurately and creatively, funny, in a funny way, teaches the content to other students. And so what I find is when we do those types of projects, you have to have a first take. You have to be able to see their first try at it to make sure they're doing the content accurately. So the other students can give suggestions about what they can see and what they can't see. Maybe, maybe suggestions on how to be more creative and funny. Okay? I'm done with social studies. Uh, we show those examples. We'll move on. Keep it simple, we talked about. Here's another suggestion. This is simulations. If you think about um, that class that probably struggled with that highly verbal activity, one part of the assessment that they did really well on that class was the steps of a bill becoming a law. They nailed this part of the test. And when I asked the teacher, this is what she said. Well, we introduced it with that video, remember? I'm just a bill from Schoolhouse Rock. But she also let the students um, take their own idea and walk through each of the steps of their idea becoming a law. And so by allowing them to simulate the content, walk through it, they were able to interact with it and were more likely to remember it and apply it. Okay? Give you another example of Mr. Potato Heads that were created in Mr. Topless class. I don't think you can get the audio on that. But to teach him about the assembly line, he does this whole thing with them where at the bottom he has two groups. Well, they all have to build potato heads, right? But the group on one side of the class has to design the entire potato head from scratch. So one person has to build a whole potato head, then start on a new one, and they have a race. Then there's another group on the other side of the room that does it like an assembly line. One person does the first step, another person does the second step, and so on and so forth. And he has a race. And that's how he gets him to think about the impact of, of the assembly line system on things like the Industrial Revolution and the products that we have. So another way to uh, let students explore. And we could spend time doing this, but short version is this. You Google simulations in social studies, simulations in science, and you'll get tons of them. Uh, some of my favorites are this Jamestown one we talked about at Mace. This is one of my favorites, which is Incredibots 2. And what Incredibots 2 allows you to do is build basic and complex machines for tasks. So let's say you want to make a car. You give them a project. You have to make a car that jumps this ramp here, but you can only use like 12 pieces or less. Students can use the simulation to use gears, motors, pistons, density of objects, and create all these different, different solutions to a single problem, which is ultimately very, um, very crucial to what they're going to be asked to do in the real world. So that one's Incredibots 2. A lot of fun. Uh, we talk about games um, often. We talk about smartphone apps. And so short version of this was 
you can take uh, any smartphone, be it a droid or an iPhone, and start to look at um, applications that are heavy on the non-linguistic. And the one that I always share is, um, I think it has to do with, with the younger students. Here you go. This is what you're seeing. This is one called Kids Numbers, and it's heavy on the non-linguistic. It requires them to count and do the verbal part. But if, as you turn it sideways here, look, you have the verbal representation on the bottom, the numbers. But on top, you also have the what? You have the pictorial representation, the visual. And it's kind of cool because you can take it, count them, shake it up, and it changes it. So when you're going to look for games or apps for your students, find those that are balanced in the verbal and the nonverbal, the visual and, sorry, the linguistic and the non-linguistic as well. Okay? So whether a simulation is real life in the classroom or online, as we're talking about in MACE, simulations are a wonderful way for students to explore the content. Now these are the other ones that we talked about briefly. In the interest of time, we're going to cut this short. We talked about spreadsheet and other data collection tools, letting students go out and be involved in the collection of data. Okay? Um, Double-checking claims made in textbooks and things like that. Send them out their tools, but their cell phones or whatever. Have them interview people and record those interviews, uh, either audio or video as well. Using their cell phones to go out and take pictures of things that represent what you're doing in class. Uh, using music and audio files. Teachers providing audio files to help students um, understand questions like, for example, walked into a social studies class for music and audio files. And here was the question. Why do Americans react differently to different wars throughout American history? And so he played the theme from 1941, didn't tell them what it was, and had them write down all the emotions they had. And had them guess what that war was. They guessed it was eventually World War II. Then he played a song that was, um, what's that one? Someone from Vietnam, a very angry anti-establishment song. And from that, he had them guess what it was, what, song, uh, what war it was. And as a result, they figure that out. So there's a teacher who's using mo music and audio files to introduce content. We talked about podcasting, allowing students to create their own audio. Video editing, we do a lot of in my class. We let the students do it. But it's also fun as a teacher to create montages, to create little fun videos to introduce concepts. So teachers have to be willing to mess around with video. Animation is one we'll show you real quick. Students need to start thinking of uh, ways that they can create fun things for other students. And we'll show you one real quick, and I think we'll end with that. To that. So here's a student project. And he comes to the teacher and he says, hey, can I do it my own way? And what's the answer to that? The answer is always yes. Let's just make sure it fulfills the terms of the assignment. So he had to do a creative summary of the book Fahrenheit 451 and tie it to the heroic text structure. So he took the important events of the book and then took Star Wars and tried to put the two together. And this is what he came up with. Four, five, five. Okay, so once upon a time, sometime in the future, we all live in a society where we burn books. Anyway, there's a guy named Guy Montag. This is his actual name, Guy Montag. Well, one day, Montag runs to another guy named Clarice. Clarice is what you would call an odd duck. Well, she asks Montag, are you happy? And Montag's like, no. Anyways, that night, Montag's wife, Mildred, overdoses some pills and dies. But not really. For a while there, Montag goes crazy. But in the end, he learns that Clarice is dead and that books are good. Next day at work, Montag's attacked by a robot called the Mechanical Hound. And it's like, I'ma do it. I'ma do it. But it doesn't do it. Then there's a fire, and Montag gets away with stealing a book. The next day, Montag's boss, Captain Beatty, finds out about the book. He tells Montag that he has 24 hours to dispose of it. And Montag's like, screw that! Instead, Montag attempts to read them, but he gets frustrated. So he calls his old friend Faber. And they're like, what's up? So that's probably enough of that. But you can see a student who worked very hard on a project to summarize the content in a creative way and starts to make these connections as you watch the rest of it. You can watch it on our on this website up here at the top. You can watch all of it. It makes these connections to Star Wars. And so the whole thing was what? If you think of what we do as teachers as a tandem bicycle, it's no fun to pedal on your own. You can't just do one part, you have to do both parts. It helps to get others involved. Many teachers do the non-linguistic, the verbal. What we really need to do is make sure that we do the visual as well, the non-linguistic. But we don't just want to switch over and just teach through interpretive dance and nonsense like that. The key point is to do both in tandem. And so doing the verbal and the visual and the kinesthetic, as well as using technology to drive it forward, is really what we're talking about here at MACE. Same thing with creativity. Teacher creativity is great. Student creativity is even better. When you put those together and use technology as a vehicle to drive it forward, then we have more productive classrooms. We have better learning taking place. And in a sense, that's what we're talking about. The presentation was this. Basically, we did a lightning tour of the research. We looked at the use of non-linguistic representations to improve classroom learning. And then we explored the need for teacher and student creativity.
Okay? Just remember, when it's all said and done, the research said this. Is it verbal? Is it visual? Are they moving around? Am I creative in giving chances to create? And then find ways to use technology to make that happen. Okay? And that's it. See you next time at Mason.